Welcome back from lunch. I hope you're all fortified, getting that uh, blood flowing around the food, sending nourishment to your brain. So we've got some uh, brainy folks here to talk about satellite mega constellations. Uh, for those of you who haven't been to NSMA before, this is the National Spectrum Management Association. Many of you are in the morning meetings, but for those who weren't, NSMA was founded 40 years ago at the request of the FCC, and its mission is to develop guidelines for the reduction of harmful interference and also to figure out if there's going to be harmful interference, any other sort of harmful spectrum-related uh, matter in conjunction with the development of new technologies, the release of new spectrum bands, or a combination of the both. And today, uh, and this afternoon, we're starting off with a satellite mega constellation proceeding. And we're pleased to have Trey Hambury as our first speaker, and then Scott Millwood and Dr. Will Bowder. And I don't know if Bo Backus made it, but uh, those are the folks on the panel along with myself. And I'd first like to introduce Trey. Trey's spoken uh, for a few years now at NSMA, and we're always pleased to have him. He's a wealth of knowledge in the spectrum uh, world as well as in the satellite world. He's a partner with Jenner and Block's Washington DC office and also co-chair the communications internet and technology practice there. Very extensive experience working for the private and public sector sectors on a variety of communications policy issues including wireless, uh, spectrum, satellite and international telecom matters. Trey came to Jenner and Block from another firm and prior to that time from Sprint Nextel where he served as director of government affairs in that position, he was acted as regulatory counsel in major rulemaking proceedings, mergers and acquisitions, in cases before the FCC, the National Telecom and Information Administration of the Department of Commerce, and the Departments of Justice and Homeland Security, as well as practicing before Congress and the federal courts. And welcome, Trey. Joe, thank you for having me here. It's a it's a pleasure to be here. I have spoken now for a, a couple of years on mega constellations and what to expect and how it's progressing and with each passing year the the interest has grown and the amount of deployment has increased and while i've done a, a powerpoint presentation in the past i figured i would try to branch out a little bit and and try to think about some new things but part of that is to tell you what's changed and what's happening and one of the one of the main chroniclers of what we're seeing in mega constellations is a guy named Jonathan McDowell. I don't know how many of you follow him, but he's got a great website, Planet 4589, and he's tracking all the major mega constellations. He's tracked 18 of them in some form of development or deployment. And those 18 constellations have a total of 537,267 planned satellites. Um, Eight of those eight of those eighteen constellations have launched at least one satellite. So these are not vaporware systems, even if that total satellite count might be inflated. Um, when you tally up all of the satellites that have been launched, there's more than sixty six hundred satellites of the mega constellations that are now in orbit. All of that data is as of May thirteenth, so it's very current data, and we're looking at just an enormous amount of investment and innovation that is happening with mega constellations. And that's going to put increasing demands, not only on the spectrum environment, but also on the orbital resources that we all must share. And so I know that the panel here is going to really focus on the latter, but both are equally important. What are those 18 mega constellations? Well, one of them, of course, is Starlink, which has uh, some depending on who's counting, uh, more than 4,000 satellites in orbit today, but with a total plan of 34,000 satellites. Again, remains to be seen if all of those will come to be realized. Next would be OneWeb with more than 6,000 satellites planned. Amazon's Kuiper system, more than 3,000 satellites planned. Uh, China's, uh, I'm gonna butcher the name, I'm sure people could correct me, uh, it's Xinwang with nearly 1,000 satellites. There's Guanwang, another satellite system from China with nearly 13,000 satellites planned. Uh, another one, uh, just as an example, Hanwha from Korea, 2,000 satellites planned. Link, 
2,000 satellites, Astra, 13,000 satellites, Telesat, 300 satellites, HVNet from Hughes, 1,400 satellites, Spin Launch, uh, 1,190 satellites, Global Star, more than 3,000 satellites, Semaphore from France at 116,000 satellites or more, and eSpace. Again, it remains to be seen whether it will be fully realized, but breaking the scales at 337,000 satellites plan. Um, when we look at where they, what administrations are backing them, there are many common themes. Most are from the United States. You have some sponsored by the administrations of the UK, France, Germany, Canada, Korea, China. And that's pretty much the universe of mega constellations. And the vast majority of those, again, are from the United States. Um, when we think about the orbital resources involved, certainly there's some degree of risk of inner satellite collisions or collisions with other objects. Um, but the nice feature of having all of these mega constellations is they all have an incentive to preserve the low Earth orbit environment. They all want, I would think, to be responsible players because they depend on continuous access to that environment. But I think the reality that we need to start to think about, and this is where I'm trying to think a little bit differently and going to ask each of you to think a little bit differently, is that not all spacefaring nations have any incentive to preserve the low Earth orbit environment. And that could very well be a problem. So Who's not on our list of mega constellation nations? India, Russia, Iran, Taiwan, Turkey, Vietnam, Pakistan, Hungary, Israel, the list goes on. Now, many of those are not uh, countries that we would expect to have an adversarial posture to the United States, but they might have an adversarial posture to other nations in the world. And if they don't have a stake in or interest in preservation of the low Earth orbit, then we could have a very uh, big problem because it becomes what looks more like a threat rather than something that's going to enable connectivity, promote economic development, uh, or aid in you know, internal communications deficits. And so we have an international environment that has a pretty strong history of uh, I don't know, an enduring anarchical nature. It's something where states who are feeling threatened in any way will not necessarily abide by international norms, um, especially to the extent they see a security or a competitive threat. And so when we think about what these states might do, to the extent they continue to be disenfranchised from this mega constellation system, I think there are more incentives for them to create an environment where uh, they're disabling systems. Now, that could be uh, a challenge, obviously, because we're talking satellite constellations with thousands of satellites. Uh, but if they are aggressors and they have nothing to lose from a low Earth orbit um, disablement, they could just wreak havoc. They don't need to target individual satellites. They could target the entire environment. And it's that kind of, I think, unilateral threat that we should start to at least think about and try to think whether having this world of haves and have nots really makes a lot of sense. And including whether uh, having that continued disenfranchisement of so many different countries um, makes sense and is actually in our national best interest. This is not really a terribly new idea. Um, the Union of Concerned Scientists uh, has said that, you know, we should really work to strengthen the taboo of attacks on satellites. And yes, sure, we, we should do that. <laughs> um, the problem is, well, how do we do that? Please, please tell us exactly how we make that happen. And they're a little shy on details. They are much more a call to action and trying to explain to everyone that we really need to strengthen that taboo as opposed to what we need to do to enable it. And so I started thinking about in preparation for this brief talk, how could we make that work? Well, one model would be to just outlaw that, to strengthen the treaties that we have today, to promote the demilitarization of 
uh, space. And I think that has a really positive role to play, but there are limits to what we can do there. I, I don't know if I have a saying earlier uh, that I have a 15 or 14 year old son and he's studying uh, kind of World War II and the run up to World War II. And uh, so it's top of mind for me. And in 1928, um, there were two gentlemen who led a convention that became globally recognized. Every major in the world, every major country in the world signed on to it. It's called the Kellogg Briand Pact, 1928. It outlawed war. Um, and it it turns out it, it it included everyone. I mean, Germany, Japan, Russia, the United States, France. Uh, turns out it didn't work so well. Um, and I think that treaty driven uh respond you know responsibility and behavior it has a place and we should do that because i think that could help escalate the taboo on these types of features um but it has its limits too and so the question is well what else could we do um because there are a lot of risk factors and they're not going away we've got this multipolar dynamic uh in the in the world with lots of competing rivalries um Countries, I think, stand to benefit, especially if they could disable systems, uh, because there would be a certain amount of national prestige involved from just littering the low Earth orbit with debris. Um, there also might be a little bit of uh, invisibility and less uh, negative associated with that than, say, a nuclear attack, because nuclear is here on Earth, and even if it's chaos in low Earth orbit, it's going to be largely invisible to the people on the ground. So there's probably less uh, blowback in terms of, you know, public relations, fewer physical risks. If you blow up a nuclear weapon, we know where to find you. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll destroy your country. It might be, it might be a bit harder or at least harder to retaliate because you've not damaged anything on the ground. Um, and there are limits on how much we can control the technology. So unlike nuclear weapons, you know, it's it's not a visible, wouldn't necessarily have to be a visible material. Um, but I do think that maybe a nuclear non-proliferation uh, strategy might have some resonance here. And, and one of the ways that I guess in the 1970s and 1980s that uh, non-proliferation sort of was encouraged is that we gave a lot of countries access to the technologies that we nuclear technologies that we didn't so much fear, sort of light water reactors. And we essentially allowed the diffusion of knowledge and the incorporation of some of these countries into this system of connectivity, in our case with mega constellations, that we, um, we are building and we're constructing and we're constructing overwhelmingly in the United States and to some degree China. Um, but I think that that kind of runs headlong into a lot of the a lot of the supply chain security needs that we are struggling with as well. We're concerned about giving technology to Russia, allowing them access to, say, Starlink in the Ukraine, and for good reason. These can be powerful technologies in the hands of the wrong people. But if we completely disenfranchise folks, then I think my fear is that we may very well uh, find ourselves in a situation where this asymmetrical uh, combat or asymmetrical disabling of a really critical resource, low Earth orbit, becomes a viable solution for some of these uh, countries around the world. And so my, my approach is, I think uh, mega constellations are going to be part of the ecosystem. And we should really think about how to diversify that ecosystem, expand it to more countries, allow people, uh, allow national actors to access those resources, but in a way that that encourages them to embrace these norms of behavior and and find a world where we can allow these systems to persist and allow the low Earth orbit to be protected for the future. So those were some opening thoughts to kind of kick us off and hopefully um, set a tone for what we're going to hear from the rest of the panel. So I'll uh, I'll stop here. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Trey. That's a great way to open up and sort of get everyone's mind, uh, uh, you know, warmed up to the notion of uh, the the large scale impact, the global impact of satellite mega constellations. And and you heard from the numbers there that what we're really talking about are networks that are going to make, you know, 
Verizon or whatever look sort of like a corner store compared to the size of a network that can blanket the earth. And it's, you know, if you start thinking about the scale there, uh, it's that's not an exaggeration in the least. So, uh, but before we get into those details a little too far, I want to introduce our next guest who's coming in virtually from the United Kingdom, Scott Millwood. Uh, Scott is a uh, LLM, uh, which is a uh, advanced law degree for those of you who don't follow LLMs. Uh, he's a former EU uh, regional manor, manager. He's an international relations uh, expert at the German Aerospace Center, uh, Deutsche is at the Zentrum, and, uh, and a telecom and space lawyer who's worked with uh, industry support and global network infrastructure in Europe and the APAC regions. He's a former chief privacy officer and general counsel in telecommunications. He brings a strategic mindset to regulations in, in this burgeoning area. Um, he recently authored uh, uh, a book, uh, the only known book I'm aware of, on the titled The Urgent Need for uh, Regulation of Satellite Mega Constellations. And uh, he can speak to that a little further in a moment, but uh, I encourage you to read that. It has a great history on the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, which hasn't been updated since, and is very, very interesting. And, and it also includes a lot of recommendations uh, from a lot of sources regarding what to do at this point, and, and a lot of what Trey is talking about as well is in, encapsulated in there. Um, he has contributed to our on artificial intelligence, mega constellations, surveillance, cybersecurity, and regulatory reform. He holds an advanced master's in air and space law from Leiden University, a master's in German and EU law from Humboldt University in Berlin, and is a member of the International Institute of Space Law, or ISIL, and he's made a documentary films for public broadcasters and the National Geographic Channel. So without further ado, we'll uh, hopefully with a push of a button, uh, we'll get Scott in a moment on the screen and talking. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, my name's Scott Millwood. Joe um, gave me a terrific introduction. Thank you very much. Um, I really wrote this book. Um, it was my pandemic project. Um, and I wrote it because I was working in Leiden at the Leiden University at the time um, when the first batch of Starlink was launched. And as many of you may know, um, Netherlands is a major centre for astronomy and there was great consternation about the impact of Starlink and mega constellations on astronomy and scientific research in the EU. So I undertook um, interviews with some of the key EU stakeholders, um, IAU president and um, US astronomy stakeholders. Um, and I should say this is, even though it's published by S Springer, this is not so much an academic book as an extended essay that charts the rise um, of, of or the development of the Outer Space Treaty, satellite constellations and the new phenomena of mega constellations and their impacts on the space activities of others. So I'm just going to um, make five points with, I think, five slides on some of the factors that are driving the rollout of mega constellations, the difference between the US and EU approach to precaution and due regard, the phenomena of over-exploitation over of global commons and what Hardin called the tragedy of the commons, the major impact on astronomy and interference with science, and my thesis, I guess, is that governance is the only solution. Um, I should say from the outset that this is very much a, a, a EU perspective. Um, I'm sure there'll be US delegates who, who may beg to differ with me. But during my research, one of the, one of the major factors that I identified um, in 
the rollout of mega constellations and what is really driving um, driving this technological solution is the rapid expansion and space race, if you like, towards 5G and the race to control the Internet of Things. Um, as you'll know, Ericsson and Nokia are based in EU countries. Um, digital sovereignty is a major theme, of course, in the EU as it is in the US. And who are we, of course, is the major China Chinese supplier of 5G infrastructure. One of the things that I think in many ways led to a modern Sputnik shock, if you like, um, was the realisation that without national providers of 5G infrastructure, the US was at a disadvantage um, in relation to China. And at the centre of this is, of course, the growing influence of China in the world and a US-China rivalry that we've seen escalated, escalating in under recent uh, presidencies. Um, I won't go into great detail, but I, I trawled through lots of con Congress reports and committee reports, and one of the major themes was the need to harness US disruptive technologies in Leo in order to counter um, who are we, Ericsson, Nokia. And I would suggest that US policy in many ways supported a winner in SpaceX's Starlink. There's just a couple of quotes um, to reinforce my argument. Um, yours, the major theme, of course, was the extent to which 5G infrastructure in the world was uh, creating a, a great dependence on China. Um, and one of the, the quote there at the bottom, of course, is from President Trump during his, um, his presidency, that the race to 5G is a race America must win and it's a race, frankly, that our great companies are now involved in. Um, second point I want to make is about the transatlantic difference in relation to precaution and its major implications, especially in relation to mega constellations in LEO. As many of you will be aware, the Outer Space Treaty um, has precautionary principles embedded in it. It calls for due regard in relation to the space activities of all other um, spacefaring nations. The typical EU approach, and we see this embedded in the EU treaties and in, in all EU policy and regulation, is an approach to precaution to avert harm prior to authorization. That requires impact assessments, consideration of intergenerational, environmental, geopolitical impacts, and other principles such as proportionality and sustainability. Um, as many of you will know, um, the EU, as part of its digital sovereignty um, strategy, is preparing to um, build and launch IRIS um, that the EU has already, or the European Commission has already announced that will go through considerable um, impact assessment. I say impact assessment because it's not just environmental impact um, that's important. There's a whole range of factors that should be considered. Um, and another important principle is that greater precaution is requ required where the risk is high. Um, as we all know, LEO is the only orbit in which human life is regularly at risk. Um, from an 
European perspective, that would call for greater precaution um, um, because of that risk to human life on the International Space Station, Chinese Space Station. The US approach differs in this, and we see this as well, not just in relation to FCC um, regulation of satellites and orbit, but we see it in relation to pharmaceuticals, medicine, etc. is that the US tends to favour regulation when evidence of harm is firmly established. That assists us in understanding why FCC authorised Starlink and other mega constellations in LEO without any impact assessment. Of course, some of those companies um, may have undertaken internal impact assessment themselves, um, but nonetheless, no regulatory impact assessment was required. And many of you will recall that the US um, took a policy approach of removing red tape in LEO and not requiring impact assessments for that orbit in order to facilitate commercial enterprise. Third point I would like to make, and we've already heard some, um, some ideas about this as well. Um, in a global commons, every country benefits from its free resources, but the negative impacts are shared by all. Um, out of space, all of the orbits are, of course, a global commons, just as the high seas are, um, the deep sea bed, Antarctica, albeit in another treaty form. Um, and in um, a commons and a global columns, commons like outer space, when one major power launches a technology, in this case mega constellations, um, without regard to orbital capacity, it creates a race for control of low Earth orbit. Each major power is compelled to follow the first mover. Um, history tells us that, and we already know that not only US, UK, um, through OneWeb and in, um, together with India, um, but the Chinese, of course, are also um, advancing their constellations in relation to that techno technological race. Um, in every commons, the idea that if I don't do it, another person will, holds firm. If the US does not move to, um, to occupy and use low Earth orbit, I have no doubt another power will. In this philosophy and this theory, eventually the commons collapses because it can't con sustain all competing interests. Um, many of you may recognise the name Garrett Hardin, who, um, who comprehensively documented th this idea in the 1960s. And he, his thesis as is mine, is that this can only pre be prevented through governance. Many of you will be aware, so I, I won't repeat it um, because this has attracted much media um, attention and many working groups over the last few years since Starlink first launched. Um, there's two images that hopefully you can see of the impact of Starlink on, on astronomy and telescopes. The streaks are, of course, the Starlink um, sat individual satellites passing through, sorry, I'm not an engineer or astronomer, but passing through the different fields of view in those um, telescopes. And it's been well documented now by the International Astronomy Union and other working groups of the extent to which mega constellations interfere with optical and radio techniques that are used to study the universe. 
In my book, I also go into some detail on the geopolitical impact, which is related to the space race um, and the rivalry, rivalry between, particularly between US and China, as space powers race to dominate Leo. That is, of course, because Leo is as well a finite resource with finite um, orbits and finite spectrum. One thing that's become very clear in recent years is that the cost of science and astronomy adapting to this interference, and there have been various techniques um, developed in order to remove the Starlink data um, or to, um, to guess or calculate when they will pass through and attempt to avoid them. But the, the bottom line is that it drives up the cost of science as astronomy and scientists bear the cost of adaptation to that interference. Um, in the last couple of years, there have been um, some important scientific um, um, research and reports that have highlighted the extent to which the burn, burn up by design um, of mega constellations as they re-enter Earth's atmosphere may cause damage to the ozone layer um, and which of course is another global comment where we've actually been very successful in, in turning back the damage to the ozone layer, may have irreversible long-term impacts on astronomy and of course when we talk about sustainability we really must also talk about intergenerational impact. So my final point is that governance is the only solution. This is not a technical problem, not a technical challenge requiring a technical solution, not a, not a legal problem requiring a legal solution. There have been many new agenda items introduced at UN COPUS, the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. There have been proposals for new treaties, emotive attempts to treat the dark sky as world heritage. My view is they are all bound to fail. And the reason is because it's a governance problem and will require a governance solution. So my final slide, I make one key re recommendation um, that in this presentation, um, but also in my book, and that is that we must together pursue avenues to strengthen governance and regulation with key agencies that are responsible for authorization and regulation of mega constellations. As I said, I'm, I'm not a great fan of, of new treaties and as Joe highlighted the outer space treaty has never been amended what I would like to see and what I would like to st see um, state delegations um, support is the introduction of impact assessments for all constellations in low earth orbit um, particularly at the FCC given it is the most important authoriser and supervisor of those um, applications at present. Um, such impact assessments should take a whole of project approach. We've seen with almost all of the um, tech giants that they've introduced applications for this little batch and this little batch and this little batch over time. That no doubt um, minimises the risk of... Um, of uh, those plans being challenged, but it's really important that the whole of project is looked at in impact assessment. You can see here my building blocks on the right side. There are many other examples that I won't highlight at this point, but there is an opportunity for the FCC, the European Commission, Ofcom in the UK, to agree on a global standard for assessment and approval of mega constellations and in turn coordinate that alignment with Russia, China, Japan, India. And as the last speaker said, I also see this 
as taking a disarmament lens in many ways, a non-proliferation approach by which major global powers can be invited into the tent um, and an equal playing field can be created for all through coordinating international regulation. I'm always happy to be involved in this conversation. There's my contact details and emails should any of you wish to discuss further offline and, of course, where you can buy the book. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Scott. Please, uh, as we say in the U.S., hang around the hoop, and we're going to continue down our panel, and we'll have a little Q&A, and hopefully you can join us in that part. Um, and I'd, I'm pleased to next uh, introduce Dr. William Bowder, uh, who is a physicist at the Government Accountability Office. Hold on, we're doing a little technical. I can keep talking? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, he evaluates emerging technologies, and uh, there's been two extraordinary studies, at least in my view, uh, JO did on, on, on satellite, uh, large constellations, mega constellations in the last few years. Uh, he advises Cong Congress, congressional staff, policymakers, and since joining the GAO in 2019, Will has worked on a number of technical areas, including GPS modernization, altered, uh, alternative uh, positioning, navigation and timing, and the effect of large constellations of satellites. Prior to his time at GAO, Will worked as a program manager, technical advisor, and operations executive in the private and public sectors. His career is focused on defense and homeland security issues and technologies, he earned a PhD in physics from the University of Notre Dame and his bachelor's from Hamilton College with a major in physics and a minor in history. Welcome, uh, Will. All right, we're at the turning point in the panel. Really stretch out through the after lunch, stretch out at this point, right? <laughs> uh, so thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, for those of you in this community who are not familiar with GAO, um, GAO is a legislative branch organization, and I work for their Science Technology Assessment Analytics Group. And one of our primary functions is to assess emerging technologies and advise Congress and the public on their capabilities, uh, the challenges, and what the policy space is surrounding. So I'm going to talk about two pieces of work that we did, as Joe mentioned. One was a technology assessment looking at environmental effects of large satellite constellations. And another one was a look kind of specifically at the FCC's uh, regulatory process and their categorical exclusion with respect to environmental uh, impact assessments of the mega constellations. Uh, so there's a few key points that I want you to take away. And I'll just say up front, one is that the satellite growth from this large constellations is rapid. I think Trey highlighted that very nicely in his numbers. Two, this growth brings new capabilities, and I want to be sure to highlight that because all of our discussion of effects starts from acknowledgement of the capabilities that the satellites bring as well. But they also bring in an array of environmental effects or potential effects. Um, the nature of the effects, uh, which I think Scott highlighted as well, is <clears throat> they're global, interrelated, and continuously changing. And then finally, as we look at the FCC's policies, what we found is that they're not the current FCC policies are not uh, designed to meet the moment of this challenge. The satellite growth is growing, and I think that we've highlighted that. There's a series, when we looked at um, the environment, what we wanted to do is look at the environmental effects of this. And I should say that our environmental effects are not limited to the NEPA definition. I know there's a specific legal definition. We wanted to take a broader approach and look at the entire life cycle of the satellite launch and what could possibly be affected by the growth specifically of the satellite constellations. And so what we found is there's a number of different effects over the entire life cycle. So as the rocket launch, as your rocket emissions goes up, there's known particulate effects with the atmosphere and affecting the upper atmosphere and affecting the ozone layer. How do those scale as we go up? When you're in orbit, I think Scott mentioned both the optical and radio astronomy implications. So there's reflections off the satellites there's uh, broadcasts, obviously, in the radio frequency, and these are already seeing profound effects on the astronomers as well as other groups. On the re-entry piece, again, we have we looked and saw that there's particulates breaking up 
that have a potential effect on the upper atmosphere, as well as the calculations on the casualty risk if you have large enough pieces that are breaking up and falling to Earth. And finally, I think Trey highlighted the space traffic issue and the orbital debris issue is that as the intensity, uh, as the number of satellites increases, um, thank you. You'll see increased needs on traffic and increased needs to mitigate orbital debris. So um, these are the range of effects that we've seen. And what we saw is that each of these um, communities is sort of, and we talked about a couple of them, is facing similar sets of issues, but they're sort of siloed from each other. And they're, you know, there's a difficulty in communication between them, but they're all facing, do I dare try and advance to the next slide? Yes. Um, so, but they're all facing similar types of, of challenges. So what is the policy answer of how you address that? And it's complicated. It's complicated by two factors. One is that um, initially we heard some people say, well, let's just stop launching satellite constellations. Well, it turns out that's not that easy. And it's not necessarily clear that you would want to do that um, because they do provide benefits. So in the absence that you have these uh, satellites in space and you have potential environmental effects for these environmental effects we've, we've found, what um, is the, uh, what are the options? So um, essentially what we found is all of these, there's different, what we outline here is there's different policy ideas each of them need. Sometimes we'll have technology, sometimes there just needs to be data sharing. Sometimes there may need to be regulations and updates on that. Sometimes Overall, we need better organization and coordination, not only at a national and international level, but a grassroots movement, because we need things, these, because on the left-hand side here, what we're facing is a very uncertain environment. So there's not only a changing landscape, there's not only new countries getting into this, there's new constellations being filed for around the world, but there's also trade-offs. And this is one of the interesting things that we found. Uh, one of my favorite examples is that um, looking at orbit height. Okay, so that's a solution. The, astro the optical astronomers will come to you and say, look, we've studied this issue, we've had some conferences. If we raise the orbit height of the satellite by a few hundred uh, kilometers, that will reduce its apparent brightness and it doesn't have such a big impact on our telescope. Okay, that's good. The, the satellite companies say, okay, we can raise it. Then the orbital debris community comes along and they say, well, if you raise the orbit height and the sat once the satellites are defunct, unless they're actively sent down to re-enter into the earth, you have them, it takes them longer to decay and return to earth. And not by just a few years, but it goes from five years to hundred years or more as you raise up to these orbit heights. So that's a trade-off. How do you deal with that? And I think, you know, um, that this organization and leadership component and finding groups that can communicate within each other and act to the changing landscape is essential sort of finding from that. Now, a couple of words on one piece of organization before I sit down, which is the FCC's role. So as many of you probably know, but since no one did me um, the service of, mention, of defining it sooner, I'll have to take my uh, legal, um, put my legal hat on for a second. Um, so the FCC licenses uh, the satellites and has a categorical exclusion for uh, the large satellite constellations, which basically says, as not a lawyer, that um, this technology is familiar enough that we know that it's not going to have an environmental um, effect, and so we don't need to file an environmental impact statement. So we looked at that, um, the FCC's rules, based on um, the current environment of uh, satellite constellations and the potential environmental effects. And essentially what we found is that that ruling is not um, really met to meet the moment of what it is, and a number of FCC processes could be updated to improve that. Specifically, we recommended to the FCC that they take a new look at the category exclusion, which is from 1986, and see if it still applies to the large satellite constellations. In addition, they should come up with an internal process to document, an internal documented process to update the category exclusions periodically so they can adapt to the changing frameworks. And the final piece has to do with um, when exceptional circumstances uh, arise, that either their staff or the licensees have to file with, we recommended that they issue some guidance in terms of what would be considered um, exceptional to do that. So that's just one sort of example that we looked at in a narrow slice, fitting into the larger piece of how organizations can start to take leadership over um, realizing the benefits of the constellations while also mitigating some of these up and understanding some of the upcoming environments. So 
With that, I will uh, pass out to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Very helpful, and I love those graphics as well. Um, you're going to help uh, pull up slides while I introduce our next guest speaker, Bo Backus, who's also on the board of the National Spectrum Managers Association here. Uh, Bo, besides being just a good, genial guy, is a spectrum manager at NOAA. Uh, that's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and any uh, SBIS, whose acronym I don't recall, NESDIS, uh, in Silver Spring, Maryland, and is a senior spectrum manager in space uh, exploration sector at the Johns Hopkins uh, Applied Physics Laboratory in Laurel, Maryland. Uh, Bo is a founding member of the Commercial uh, Small Sat Spectrum uh, Management Association. He served on the NTIA Policy and Program Steering Group and Spectrum Working Group, uh, the Space Frequency Coordination Group, the ESA, NASA, and JAXA Frequency Coordination Meeting, uh, and, he, and the uh, DOD, NASA, and uh, DOC coordination groups. He served as a U.S. delegate in the successful World Radio Conference 15 in Geneva, Switzerland, is now participating in several ITU and U.S. working parties as, uh, as preparations uh, continue for the coming works in uh, the coming years. He chairs the ITU for a subworking group for studies relating to the frequency band uh, S14, uh, 4 52.4 gigahertz, for possible allocation, allocation in the fixed uh, satellite service at the Earth to space. Um, and he's also a former Air Force officer and has been a member of the spectrum management community for over 30 years. Welcome, Bo. I'll start off with. Um... Uh, uh, just a uh, real quick uh, thank you to Joe for a great introduction, and it serves me um, well to next time I will update it a little bit um, in that. Uh, that was from work uh, 19, and uh, we've moved on to work 23 and finished that one, and, uh, and I'm not sharing that anymore. We finished it. <laughs> and there were some happy people and some unhappy people. Um, Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you about uh, um, uh, satellite megal constellations. What does NOAA have to do with that? Well, we have some concerns. Uh, uh, and I wouldn't even say concerns, but there's things that you need to watch out for. And I wanted to start off real quick um, with a little bit of information just on the on the stats on on what what we're looking at. You know, right now, or at least uh, about a month ago, uh, there were about 7,500 uh, satellites operating in space. And um, and that's a growing number. I mean, it, it, up from last year, um, double practically. And I just want to say that uh, um, we're looking at uh, maybe by 2030, uh, one organization says that they think there'll be, uh, uh, you know, somewhere in the um, uh, order of about 20,000 operating satellites by 2030. Uh, GAO um, in, in one of these studies actually uh, is estimating about 58,000. I mean, these are future forecasts. So, um, you know, there's a lot of different things you have to weigh. If you didn't actually look at, you know, factors like, you know, this company will actually survive this long. Um, Quilty actually said, well, there'd be 478,000 satellites. That's how many are planned to be there. At some point. Um, so all of that adds up to we're looking at a lot of operational satellites in orbit over the next decade. And uh, all of that adds up to what is it actually doing for us? Well, the financial sector, which includes um, uh, McKinsey and company and, and others, they're estimating that uh, the value by 2035 of the space sector is about $1.8 trillion. And that's my brief. Thank you very much. <laughs> that's perfect. Thanks. Which one is it? I would just go back one. Which one is it? Is that error? Okay, left right. And I'm going to go back to here and I'll I'll step through that in just a second. But uh but so 1.8 trillion dollars by by 2035. And I was actually talking to this about not not even a year ago. And I was saying, well, it's going to be like a trillion dollars by 2040. 
And I, and less than a year later, I'm actually saying, well, it's going to be about 1.8 trillion in 2035, five years sooner. So it's playing a very important role in, in the future. And one thing that we found out with, uh, uh, with satellites is that the only way they're going to work is by accessing spectrum. You know, satellites need two things. It's like they need access to spectrum and they need gravity, but they wouldn't be a satellite. So with those things in mind, you can think of that uh, it's going to be a much greater part of the global economy over the years. We're a growing entity in this. Um, it's impact is actually much farther than just space itself. It's a player in, in things like uh, um, ride hailing, you know, your Uber apps and uh, oops, I'm sorry, it's a commercial. Um, but uh, total economy, um, defense, food, beverage, supply chains, uh, an important thing for us is uh, things like weather and uh, climatology. And, uh, and so we're looking at this as a very important role that is going to be played um, by these growing mega constellations over time. So when you start thinking about that, they all need spectrum and that they, uh, then the spectrum itself is rather finite and heavily used now. Uh, where do we go with this? And uh, one of the things that we have a concern with in, on the NOAA side is, is our weather forecasting actually relies heavily on microwave uh, radiation. Um, if you think about it, every one of us, not as much as the Earth, but every one of us actually emits radiation. Um, it's, it's constant. It's a part of the black body. And we use that uh, anthropogenic or non-anthropogenic energy, this natural energy, in order for us to be able to measure um, temperature, uh, moisture content of the atmosphere, et cetera. And the problem we have is, is that when you get into space, if you have a uh, natural energy that you're measuring and you also have anthropogenic energy or man-made uh, energy um, mixed with it, you can't really tell the difference. In fact, you can't tell the difference at this point. So what we measure could be, let's just say 135 Kelvin, and maybe that's really 130 plus five degrees of additional energy that was put in by these man-made systems. We just don't know. And here's the problem. So in the old, in the days of normal radio frequency interference, you see something like this and you say, well, the guy causing the interference would shut him down. So find them, shut them down, uh, or 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 at least find a way to mitigate it. That measured data there, the noise floor, that's what we're looking for. This is actually what we actually see in space uh, with our, our passive band sensors. We don't really see anything. It's all measured. It looks the same. We're trying to tell the difference between Gaussian and near Gaussian uh, energy. Very difficult to do. So I just want to say, you know, that, um, you know, these uh, these bands that we're trying to protect, they're spread out. And we think of them sort of like lighthouses. They can't move. They are where they are because of physics. In order for us to be able to make, make measurements um, and use them to tell us useful data, we have very specific frequencies that we tune to in order to get that data. And, uh, and so radiometers are, are built and, and uh, passive band sensors of various types are built and they look at these specific frequencies and they give us the data that we use to forecast the weather and to look at climatology and so forth and provide warnings for hurricanes and so forth. And did I just, no. <laughs> um, so as the last bullet, what I just flipped off, I don't mean to go back. The last thing says we really need to have robustness in the design of our passive band sensors. We're looking for, you know, ways to do that. And at the same time, I was talking a little bit about uh, um, microwave sensors in this case, which talks, you know, to the what I'll call the the problem that we're facing. And I mentioned five G, but five G is not the only thing. Mega constellations also need to be able to communicate with those constellations. They also have gateways and uh, earth stations and so forth. And, um, and so they need access to the spectrum. But if I'm flying a, a passive band sensor going right by that uplink while they're transmitting, 
I might actually be impacted by that energy that's coming up. Um, one other thing that I just point to, and, and this is kind of, um, it, it, in a way it's, it's sort of obvious, but if you think about it, uh, there's three different levels of, of energy that we're faced with when we're looking at um, interference um, to the passive band. First, we don't even necessarily know that we're getting interfered with, except by the data that we get back. And when you look at some of the data and it says, oh, it's about 400 degrees Kelvin in New York City. It's a hot city, but not that hot. Um, at least in the summer or winter. Um, so we call that obvious contamination. You just, you see it, you say, this is obviously uh, bad data, you throw it out. The good part is, is you're not contaminating all the other data with this bad data, you got rid of it. The bad part is, is now you have no data for that spot. So you have to actually then try to fill in that hole of data with, with other measurements and such around the area and you try to, to, to extrapolate or interpolate. Undetectable contamination is the other one um, that we are pretty good with living with. You can't detect it. It's below what our sensors can work at. The problem is, is that our sensors are getting more sensitive. So what is undetectable in uh, 2005 may be very detectable in 2025. So it's another factor that we have to think about. And then the last one, because I like this one to talk about, last, and that's the insidious contamination. Insidious is such a cool word. Um, this is the contamination where we don't know we're contaminated. So this is that five degrees where it seems plausible. It may be real data. It may be that it's five degrees hotter today than it was yesterday. It may be that the that it's a little bit wetter today than it was yesterday. We don't know. So that's, that's the danger that we face. And that's why um, we take a, a careful look and work closely with the spectrum community when we're looking at these new technologies coming into place and how well we can work together. This happens quickly, by the way. Um, it's not a slow process. Um, the soil moisture uh, measurements that were done in Japan, you can see that growth of red, which is where the interference or the energy that we're observing uh, has come into place. That happened in nine months. So when you get something that is being deployed, it can be deployed quickly. And we have to always be careful with that. Um, if we think we have bad data, what can we do? One idea that's been floated around is, well, we can flag it, you know, and say, okay, when we're going over this particular area, it's got a lot of contaminated data. We've been able to find out and we figured it out. Um, and so what can we do? Well, we'll try to flag it and say, okay, on this day or, or this hour in this location, we're not going to use that data or we're going to de-weight the data and say that we're only going to use it um, at half the, the strength that we would normally have used it in terms of the measurement. Um, that takes, you know, quite a bit of work and we're starting to, to do that. It takes quite a bit of work in order to set up the ability to detect that you have contamination and by how much. So quite a few challenges. NOAA is, is working hard to, to develop its skill set in this arena. Ever since uh, we found out in, in uh, a little bit before the World Radio Conference of 2019 about 5G that kind of woke us up um, to the fact that adjacent band uh, energy is a, is, a, um, is a problem, can be a, quite a challenge, can actually degrade uh, operations within the passive bands that are right next to it. And the reason for that, of course, is, is that modulated spectrum does not obey our, our rules that say that at 23.8 uh, gigahertz, you will not transmit any more energy past it in any frequency. Unfortunately, the way um, uh, modulation uh, works, it dies down, but it doesn't go straight down. You can't. So uh, filters and such help. Um, careful uh, coordinations work, but you have to be able to um, understand that directly adjacent energy or high powered users that are directly adjacent to you can affect the data that you're getting. So I'll just wrap this and say that we are trying to do something because if we do nothing, we don't know when or how much our national weather predictions and our NOAA missions will be degraded by RF contamination which will affect 
public safety and public property. That's what I got. And thank you. Great. Right. Thank you, Bo. That was very, very helpful to put into context, you know, the passive community, uh, you know, just because something's passive doesn't mean it's not like super important to understanding uh, like how we literally live and, and operate our lives and our, our man-made, human-made systems. Um, high level, uh, I'm just going to talk very briefly. I'm going to do maybe two slides and then we're going to jump into some Q&A. You need to change something, okay. Um, while she's doing that, so the balance group filed some years ago when SpaceX was just getting underway with some major modifications. It filed what I later learned from Scott Millwood was the world's only uh, essentially complaint in federal court or any court seeking some analysis about the impacts on uh, spectrum interference on flora and fauna, on the ability for these mega constellations to be hacked, on whether or not the um, the uh, what's known as the Great Carrington effect would have any impact on the networks that are existing today that we all rely on. For those of you who don't know about the Great Carrington effect in 1859, the largest solar flare in the history of the world occurred. It lit. Uh, Many telegraph wires on fire, telegraph operators' papers at their desks exploded into flame. And other telegraph systems uh, whose electrical currents and other uh, energy uh, sources were destroyed kept operating because of the solar flare, <laughs> kept them moving uh, the, like, the electrical impact from space. And that's kind of timely for a lot of reasons, including we just had a major solar flare last weekend. Some of you could see the Northern Lights from South Carolina or Arizona. Uh, so they weren't quite the Northern Lights, but that major solar flare event, uh, a lot of folks, there was an issue which, uh, of concern from NASA, from NOAA and other, other federal institutions that networks might go down and might go down hard. And luckily they didn't in any catastrophic way, but the uh, Carrington event of 1859 was many, many fold larger in terms of exponential impact. So what does that mean? And this is what the balance group thought about and filed about when it first made its first filing, which was, are we single threading ourselves uh, in space? Uh, we had taken down in the US, the Loran GPS system, which was uh, the last terrestrial based system uh, and put up satellite based systems. Um, and you know, how many people use GPS? How many people don't even know how to drive anywhere anymore without GPS? Uh, how many of our missile systems operate on GPS? How many other you know, train control, ship control systems? On and on and on. So um, these, are, these are not small issues. Um, no, I'm fine. Okay. So we wanted to uh, you know, highlight that, and we did uh, in, in the balance group filings. And they were summarized a, a bit in Scott Millwood's book, who you just heard from. And I think they were footnoted in one of the GAO reports that you also heard from. But there's some other things that, you know, what can you do? There, a lot of the conclusions were, let's get more involved, let's get more educated as governments, as institutions, as individuals, because that's really usually the, the way out, right? The way out is to act with some uh, coherence and some understanding. Uh, there are some opportunities, the FCC's uh, Space Bureau recently issued an, uh, a notice for comment on orbital, orbital debris and space junk. Uh, those filings will be due uh, after the, they're uh, finally published in the Federal Register, the notice and comment proceeding, but you can follow that on the Balance Group's website. Uh, there's also on June 24th, a, a, a set of uh, uh, filings that can be made on super heavy launch vehicles. This is a, a joint uh, effort from Department of Transportation, NASA, uh, I believe DOD, and about three other federal agencies. Uh, you can also follow that, follow that in the Balance Group website. But if you have a concern about any of these issues that we've been hearing about on this panel, I uh, highly recommend you go and start filing, start getting information into the system so that government can act and, and individual entities can act. I'm going to uh, uh, not go much further. That's the solar flare this past weekend. 
Uh, um, but um, I don't want to go any further because we've been eating a lot of time and want to open it up for Q&A. So uh, are there any questions for this panel? Yes. Um, and can you state your name and I'll try to repeat it over the microphone so people can hear you. Thanks. My name is Josh Redding. I'm an astronomer. Great. Josh Redding, an astronomer and a, and a, and a AAA policy fellow? AAA, yes. All right. Welcome. What's your question? Yeah, so um, so I wanted to push back a little bit on something that was said in the introductory talk. Uh, you said that largely issues pertaining to satellite observations kind of stay separated from you know, what humans do inside the space. We have our own things that we worry about. We have to um, There are kind of two ways that they may that may change in the future, and they were mentioned in the presentation. One of them is that potential environmental impact. We're already seeing detections of metals associated associated. Risk of going out of the diet by doing uh, a deep driving by climate change, too. I'll focus on the second one, which is what I care a little bit more about, um, and that's the long term sustainability of space activities. Um, and sustainability in the sense of ensuring that all active services that operate in space can continue to operate for the foreseeable future without hitting some wall in the future and trying to ease it down to that wall. Um, so everybody seems to be agreeing that we can expect to see maybe a true order of magnitude. In the count of satellites that are active in orbit. Um, we're starting to get out of the single thousands into the tens of thousands, and not the thousands is starting to come. Um, we already had satellite collisions and near misses with the number that we have up there right now. Um, there's a lot of space debris that is unconstrained, and that number will only increase as more collisions happen. Um, so, the, the, this is all just a big background for my question, which is really going towards that issue of inertia and how to make the government act proactively to regulate these issues in the focus of Scott's presentation. Um, at least, you know, in, I, I very much support going to the FCC and telling them about sustainability in the spectrum sense. Something I didn't hear mentioned is that the Department of Commerce is spinning up its office of space commerce right now. And they are about to take over commercial space traffic management from DOD, who is formally an operator all space traffic information. Um, so they now kind of have a responsibility to ensure this long-term sustainability because they are the ones who are managing those orbits and will determine that, you know, or it'll be uh, on, on them to prevent these collisions and generation of space debris and all these things in the future. How do you overcome this inertia step, like this, this, this tendency to be reactive when not only the future of individual companies who are hoping to operate in space is on the table that they can't send anything up due to some disaster that wipes out systems up there or makes orbit permanently unusable. Um, and even when you have the entire future of our capability to have space-based services is on the table too. There's no debris clouds depending on where their altitude are to be permanent. There are already some bands of Earth orbit that are permanently unusable. So how do you really push this as a motivation to be proactive? So I'll, I'll try to field the question, and I do appreciate it, um, because I think it is a limited resource, and I think people do need to get motivated. And my, my talk was intended to be a bit provocative, because I do think passive services are incredibly important. Radio astronomy, it is a multi-use environment that's being dominated by um, a particular type of deployment. And I do think that responsible actors will have a, a strong investment. And my thesis is essentially we need to get more people invested in space and a sustainable space economy. And so the more we can do that, the more diverse it can be, the, the more interest that it will generate, and the more uh, sustainable that environment will become. And so I think that can operate in the microcosm too, that making your voice heard in front of the uh, Department of Commerce in the legislature, legislature at the FCC uh, to really make sure that these issues are vetted and understood in all of their dimensions, both active services, passive services, not just communication services, but all types. It's a shared environment. Um, you know, I would push back a little bit on the on the governance point, only because I'm really concerned that if we're if we're holding back these engines of of commercial deployment in such a way that it it provokes a counter reaction that that could be very detrimental. And you'll have this unequal weighting of interest that, 
that could prove counterproductive. So it is, I, I think you mentioned about the trade-offs. It's it really does involve trade-offs, and I think we'll all have to make all the different interests will need to make compromises. You're already doing some with filtering out bad data. I think commercial industry will need to do some, uh, defense industry and so on. Um, but it's about sort of bringing this conversation to the fore and then having enough um, interest in the subject. And when I spoke about the separation between what's happening in space and what's happening on the ground, I'm only saying that because I think it's out of mind for people. People do not realize uh, the role of GPS that it plays in our lives and how important you know, those resources are, the communication satellites that connect not just, uh, not just Starlink, but also broadcast television and other, other uses, weather predictions, radio augmentation. There's a lot of new technologies available, and it's trying to bring the space economy to the individual and making it clear how valuable it is. So I think we all have a role to play in that. Any other comments on the from the panel to that? Yeah. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I think this is, I think you raised a lot of points that are, that, you know, have come up and were mulled about as we were looking at this topic. Um, one of the problems with the regulation approach is this, is that we're, there were two problems that we heard about just relying on the regulation is one is the speed, particularly on the international scale. You know, we heard folks, you know, do treaties that's, that's, you know, three to five years, let's say, or, or more to, to, yeah, or more <laughs> easily to do it. Um, and the other is the asymmetry, right? So the, the FCC has governance over the U.S., but not the world. And so will you drive companies, you know, one of the things when we looked at, oh, well, why don't we just stop launching? Is like, you can license to launch them anywhere. And then once they're up there, they're up there. And so trying to balance that, what's the solution to that? Um, well, the solution might be to, you know, develop some sort of grassroots uh, movement or standards that don't rely on that. So, you know, for example, looking at, hey, how can we, um, you know, darken the satellites so it helps you on a company to astronomer basis? Or how can we um, leave a buffer in the band that we're transmitting on that on a, on a company to basis? And then try and get the companies to adopt that, the, you know, companies that adopt this and start this as good stewards try and bring along the new entrance to it. So that was one of the ideas is like that we heard to sort of counter the fact that the regulation may reasonably lag behind, behind the, um, uh, behind the space of the technology most prominently. So. We're very grateful to the FCC for having that sustainability. <laughs> <laughs> Have to coordinate with the strong. That's good. We're all about coordination here at NSMA. So. All right. I know we've run quite a bit over, uh, but I think this is obviously, there's a lot of energy around this topic, so we probably need to, as an accordion, expand into it. I know the 2027 work is all about this, but the more work we do way ahead of that, probably the better, and I'd like to invite everyone back, and maybe we do a, an in-depth series of webinars or something on this to let the expression happen. And, and, and uh, thank you all. And before you stand up, we have Dr. George Carlo presenting uh, after the break uh, on the whole history of the WTR. This, the, this is a whole history of the wire te wireless technology research that led up from the earliest cell phones to present day and human RF exposure. And then we have a really, really talented panel with uh, Dr. Dever Davis, founder of the Environmental Health Trust with Kent Chamberlain, incoming president of the Environmental Health Trust, who also ran electrical engineering at University of New Hampshire and has a deep history in this area. We also have um, on the panel, uh, my brain is going, uh, oh, George Kaiser uh, of TIA and NSMA, former past president, and uh, Dr. Sarah Seguin, who's done a lot of work on training spectrum managers on how to comply with human RF exposure. So we'll see you on the other side of the break. Thank you.